We screwed up. We skipped Luke 7. We read Luke 6, and then I titled the video Luke 7 accidentally, when really it was Luke 6. And then we read Luke 8. So we have skipped Luke 7, so we have to go backwards. Sorry about that. The Faith of the Centurion. This is Luke 7 officially. Not... Anyway. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders to the Jews of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pled earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Jesus raises a widow's son. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man <laughs> Excuse me. I didn't take my allergy meds today. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet had appeared among us, they said. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Jesus and John the Baptist. John's disciples told him about all these things, calling two of them. He sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Let's read this again. I'm not even following. This doesn't even make sense. John's disciples told him about all these things. John's disciples, not Jesus's. John, there we go. John the Baptist's disciples. I get it now. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. 
Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. That reminds me of something one of my pastors said today in church. Somebody in the audience said it about how Jesus hung out with the tax collectors and the sinners. And then the pastor had a comment about How Jesus does that so and we as Christians should do the same or shouldn't be like repulsive to the average Joe or something I wish I could remember how he worded it it was so good what the comment that he had after they were talking about that I can't remember the way he said it but it was so good anyway So it was kind of like if Jesus hung out with the sinners and the tax collectors and they wanted to hang out with Jesus, and we're supposed to be like Jesus, then not only should we want to hang out with the sinners and the tax collectors, but the sinners and the tax collectors should want to eat with us as Christians. And we shouldn't be the kind of Christians who... don't want to hang out with the sinners and tax collectors and we shouldn't be the kind of Christians who the sinners and tax collectors want nothing to do with. That was the piece. And I don't know how he said it. He said it in like two words. I can't even say it in a paragraph. But the point was that I got out of it. I don't even know if that was his point. But it was like, if the sinners want nothing to do with you as a Christian, you're doing Christianity wrong. Because the sinners wanted to hang out with Jesus and Jesus wanted to hang out with the sinners or something. I'll have to watch it again and see what he said. I cannot remember what he said, but I thought it was a super good way he said it. This is why he's the pastor, right? And I'm not. <laughs> I cannot even, I can't even remember what the heck he said, but it was a really good point. I really liked it. Even though it wasn't part of his message, he was just commenting on what the lady said. But I th I thought it was my favorite part of the whole message today. Probably because that's the Holy Spirit, I think. I think sometimes you have to give room. These pastors have got to give room for the Holy Spirit to move. And that's a little bit my objection to my big church is because everything is so scripted. And like, and I get what I like about the big church. And now we're off topic again. But what I like about the big church is... They are the majority of the time tailoring their message to apply to everybody, right? And there's plenty of room for the Holy Spirit to like get in that pastor's message. And it's gonna apply to like 
a ton of people. And there's, there is a lot of room for the Holy Spirit to move in that way when he's like writing the message or whatever. But at the same time, during the delivery, he has it so scripted and perfected and has to say it so for so many different service times that it does kind of take away the Holy Spirit moving in the, in the moment of delivery, you know? from what it seems like. And I just kind of wish sometimes there was more room to breathe in those sermons at the big church, because I think sometimes when you lock things down so much where the sermon is so scripted, that you lose that room for God to move or, or the way that they've changed their online platform now, where it's like all like pure perfection and only stuff that's, you know, raw rod for the church gets approved to go through and they have to like limit it because it's just too hard to manage too many people. And yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit's not moving. God's not moving on that platform in the way that God used to move in that platform. So there's when it becomes too much like let's be worldly for the world, you lose the Holy Spirit a little bit. You lose breathing room a little bit. And so not everything has to be perfect. Church doesn't have to look perfect, appear perfect, and be perfect all the time. And I think that that's hard. I think that that's the, when the mold is so firm, it becomes, like we were talking about today, it doesn't become soft clay anymore. It's now hard clay. And then God can't move there. God's going to go somewhere else is my concern. So hopefully they work that out. But that's just my own assessment. But anyway, then at the small churches, what I like about it is there is more breathing room where God can move. What I don't like about the small churches is sometimes it seems like there's less Holy Spirit moments because you get a little bit more of that pastor just talking. You get more of the humanness of the pastor, especially if they think they're trying to talk directly about someone in the audience or to someone in the audience. Or Then you get that person talking to this other person, and that's not God. It's only when the pastor is being the vessel that God can move through and God can talk to certain people in the audience about whatever. When the pastor should be oblivious, they shouldn't necessarily know because that's between God and that person, right? Now that's the Holy Spirit can be moving in that way and it can make church impactful for the whoever, however many people in the audience. But when you have too much of the pastor knows their people so well, and now they're speaking directly to their people, the Holy Spirit's not doing it. That's not God. The people aren't sitting in the audience like, oh, God spoke to me today. They're like, that pastor's doing something. It wasn't God, though. And so that's what feels to me like the difference with small churches. You get more of that in a small church versus a big church. In my opinion. Anyway. We're off topic. Where was I? Luke 7. Jesus and John the Baptist. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon the son of man meaning jesus came eating and drinking and you say here is a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners but wisdom is proved right by all her children jesus anointed by a sinful woman this is the last section in luke 7 which we completely skipped over somehow i don't even know how probably because i have highlights in here i probably thought we'd already read it but that was clearly me a different day. All right. Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. What an a-hole. Let's just be honest, like seriously. 
All right. <laughs> Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Forgiven a lot, loves a lot. That's not in there. I added it. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's awesome. I cannot believe we skipped Luke 7. Now is Luke 8, parable of the sower, which we read today. Lamp on a stand. Mother and brothers. Jesus calms the storm, restores a demon-possessed man, raises the dead girl and heals a sick woman. And then next is Jesus sends out the 12. So that's Luke 9. Next. All right. That's it. Have a good day. Bye.